Well, good afternoon and welcome to the first of the RSSI panel discussions. Uh, RSSG times UBS panel discussions are a series of discussions that UBS and RSSG will be holding together to explore the wider context and cultural impact of the art market on Singapore and Southeast Asia. And we'll be hosting a number of these discussions throughout the year. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the National Arts Council and Rosa Daniel for the opportunity to speak during Singapore Art Week. Um, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Magnus Renfrew. I am the co-founder of ArtSG. Uh, ArtSG is a new fair for Southeast Asia that will welcome a hundred of the world's leading galleries to Singapore. Um, the fair is intended to be a hub fair for Southeast Asia, looking to attract collectors from not only Singapore, but from each of the constituencies within the natural catchment area. The immediate neighbourhood of Southeast Asia has a population of 650 million people, which is in scale approaching that of Europe, and, and the region is home to many of the fastest growing economies in the world. The natural catchment area for Singapore also includes India and Australia, and our hope is also that the fair and Singapore can act as a meeting place for the rest of Asia and provide an opportunity with them, uh, for them to engage with Southeast Asia. Um, Southeast Asia has been gaining in status from a cultural perspective over the last few years, and it's right, widely recognised, rightly, as one of the most exciting and culturally diverse regions in the world. Its significance is very much increasingly recognised within the international art world, as demonstrated by the timely appointment of Indonesian art collective Ruin Grupa as curators of the next documentary exhibition, which takes the temperature of the global art scene every five years. Our focus today, though, is not so much on the incredible cultural output of the region, so much as why an underlying market trajectory perspective, uh, from, uh, from an underlying market trajectory perspective, it makes sense now to engage with Southeast Asia. Our topic for today is Tigers and Art, the economic, social, demographic and consumer context for the art and luxury market in Southeast Asia. And uh, now to introduce our uh, excellent lineup of speakers for today. Um, first of all, very, very grateful for your time. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, we have, uh, joining us from UBS, we have Kelvin Tay, who is the Regional Chief Investment Officer at UBS Global Wealth Management. Good morning, Kelvin. Uh, Kelvin's based in Singapore uh, and received his MBA from Imperial College London in 1999. Um, Kelvin's uh, a monthly guest host on CNBC's Asia's Squawk Box program and regularly appears on Bloomberg TV, BBC Asia and Channel News Asia. Uh, from Sotheby's we have Patty Wong. Uh, Patty is chairman of Sotheby's Asia. Good morning, Patty. A position that she has held since 2004. Um, Patty is one of the most experienced people working in the international auction business today and has represented major Asian clients at Sotheby's important auctions worldwide for over two decades. Patty also serves as chairman of Sotheby's Diamonds, a global retail venture established in 2005, which provides clients with an opportunity to inquire, sorry, to acquire important diamonds and fine diamond jewelry privately and year round. Uh, we have Alain Lee joining us uh, from uh, Re the Richemont Group. Good morning, Alain. Uh, Alain is uh, the CEO Asia Pacific for the Richemont Group, which is a, a, a very important luxury goods group, as you will know, which owns, amongst other brands, Van Cleef & Arpels, Cartier and Vacheron Constantin. Um, in his role, Alain is responsible for overseeing and cultivating the presence of some of the most coveted luxury brands and has direct responsibility not only for uh, for uh, APAC more widely, but also has a, a strong interest in Southeast Asia. Then we have uh, Dr. Melanie Fasher. Uh, good morning, Melanie. Uh, Melanie is a social scientist and lecturer in the MA course um, of Art and Business at Sotheby's Institute in London. Uh, Melanie received her PhD in Urban and Regional Economics from Hafen City University in Hamburg. Melanie was a postdoctoral fellow in Richard Florida's Cities team at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. Uh, as you may know, Richard Florida's seminal book, The Rise of the Creative Class, was hugely influential and was first published in 2002. And during Melanie's postdoctoral fellowship, um, Melanie led a research project on the creative economy and urbanization in Southeast Asia. 
Uh, to kick things off this morning, uh, or this afternoon, where you are, um, Melanie has kindly agreed uh, in whirlwind fashion to take us briefly through some of her key findings from this research project. And so, without further ado, I will now hand over to Melanie. Melanie, over to you. Thank you, Magnus. Magnus um, asked me to share some key insights from our research project on economic development in Southeast Asia. The project was conducted in 2015 and 16, and the report was published in 2017. The project was overseen by Richard Floyder, and I was the research lead working with the bigger team. Um, in a nutshell, we explored the relationship between urbanization and the rise of the urban creative middle class. We focused on seven countries and the major city in the region, which you can see in dark purple in the middle of the map on the slide. If we go clockwise, we were looking at Singapore, Malaysia with Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok um, uh, of Thailand, then Cambodia with Phnom Penh, Phil um, uh, Vietnam with Ho Chi Minh City, Philippines with Manila and Indonesia with Jakarta. And in order to um, better understand the level of development, we benchmarked these Southeast Asian countries and major cities against others in Asia and the Pacific Rim, which you see in light purple on the map. They are China with Shanghai and Beijing, Hong Kong, India with Delhi and Mumbai, Japan with Tokyo, South Korea with Seoul, and other advanced nations like Australia with Sydney and Canada with Toronto and United States with New York. As you know, the Southeast Asian region is undergoing rapid growth and urbanization. Just over this day, decade, the 1920s, the urban population of these seven Southeast Asian countries will grow by an estimated 66 million people from around 30, uh, 313 in 2020 to 379 million people in by 2030. By then, the region will be ahead of the United States with an urban population of around 300 million people and behind Europe with 570 and India with a good 600 million people and China with 1 billion. It is projected that Asia as a whole uh, will have 2.8 million people in, uh, living in urban areas by 2030 and the region will account for half of the global economic output. Next slide, please. Urbanization is a key factor in economic development and the development of a large middle class. In the advanced nations, both have occurred in tandem over the past century or so, and this development has repeated more recently in China. The graph on this slide shows the association between urbanization on the x-axis and economic output per person on the epsilon axis. The line slopes upward, with, which indicates a substantial association between the two. And we marked our seven Southeast Asian cities and the benchmark cities. Do you see Singapore in the upper um, right-hand corner alongside with the United States and other advanced nations, followed by Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines towards the middle of the graph, similar to China, then with Vietnam, similar to India, and then followed by uh, Cambodia down towards the bottom left. Next slide, please. So the size of the creative class in percentage of the workforce determines how advanced an economy is. Today's middle class is no longer made up of blue color working class. Rather, is it, is it, it is made up by professionals and knowledge workers. The concept, as Magnus has mentioned, was coined by Richard Florida in the early 2000s somewhat contested at the time in academic circles, but more recently accepted into the scientific canon. As you can see in the figure, the creative class makes up a third to more than 40% of the workforce in advanced nations. It includes workers in creativity, 
knowledge and technology-based occupations such as sciences and technology, arts, culture, design, media, entertainment, business, management, finance, healthcare, education and law. So creativity in this sense does not only refer to artistic creativity, but to the ability of solving problems. In the US, the creative class accounts for a third of the workforce and half of all wages. The creative class are also consumers. In the US, they account for three quarters of discretionary purchasing power. The lifestyle of the creative class is associated with arts and culture, design, fashion, um, cuisine, luxury products, and so on. In the South, East Asian region, we see that Singapore outcompetes the advanced nations such as Australia, Canada, and the United States with a creative class size of 47.3%. Then Malaysia and Philippines are next with 24.3 and 21% respectively. And then uh, back when we did the study, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia have creative class shares of just below 10% and Cambodia uh, was at 4%. A look at the latest data, 2017-2019, shows that the creative class has grown. Malaysia and Philippines are now approaching levels of advanced countries with 27.4 and 23.9% uh, respectively. Thailand and Indonesia are now well above 10%, with 14% for Thailand and 11.3% for Indonesia. Unfortunately, there was no data for Vietnam. Um, next slide, please. Another measure for the middle class is education or skill. Our measure here is called the gross tertiary enrollment ratio. And this is this variable is commonly used in cross-national analysis. Tertiary education refers to post-secondary institutions such as university, colleges, and technical training institutes. The gross tertiary enrollment ratio measures those involved in tertiary education compared to the age group spanning five years after leaving secondary school. The level of educational attainment ratio in Southeast Asia is much lower than in advanced countries. Um, unfortunately, Singapore is not included here because the data was not available. Uh, with Thailand with um, a good 50%, followed by Malaysia at 36.3%, uh, then Indonesia with 27.9%, China nearly on par, uh, Vietnam chi nearly on par with China, at 23.8%, but ahead of India with roughly 22%. A look at more recent data, 2017 to 2019, shows data for Singapore at 86.8%, um, so well on par with the advanced countries. And the ratios for other Southeast Asian countries have grown. Malaysia has now a ratio of 40 4%, Indonesia is at 36.4% and Vietnam at 28.6. Um, Next slide, please. Going back to uh, cities, um, in a globally connected knowledge economy, global cities play an important role in wealth and innovativeness of their respective nations and are key for their economic success. The figure here shows the population sizes in 1980, 2015, and projected sizes for 2030 for seven global cities in Southeast Asia and the international benchmarks. Um, today, two metros in Southeast Asia have more than 10 million. Manila has 13 million and Jakarta has 10.3 million people. Four other metros have populations between 5 and 10 million. You see Bangkok as just below 10, Ho Chi Minh City 7.3 million, Kuala Lumpur 6.8 million, and Singapore 5.6 million. In 2030, four metros in Southeast Asia are projected to have populations greater than 10 million. So in addition to Manila and Jakarta, which will grow to 16 
13.8 million and 13.8 million respectively. Bangkok is projected to have 11.5 million. Ho Chi Minh City is projected to have 10.2 million. Kuala Lumpur will still uh, be just under 10 million and Singapore will approach 7 million. So our data suggests that the 21st century may well be a creative urban and Asian century. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Melanie, for giving us such a wonderful overview of the, uh, the rise of the urban creative class uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, as, a, as a starting point, now sort of moving on to our panel discussion, I would um, love to, um, to, to get Kelvin's uh, overview on how uh, Southeast Asia has developed and to contextualize Southeast Asia within Asia overall and within a global context in terms of how it's developed over the last 30 years or so. Hi, good afternoon and thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be with um, such a great panel of um, speakers here. Um, Southeast Asia has really come a long way in the last um, 30 years and I think Dr. Melanie has actually pointed out some really interesting facts with regards to Southeast Asia and I think to complement her story, um, you have the largest middle class um, boom in Southeast Asia happening at this point in time. Uh, we do expect the number of middle class consumers to reach about 400 million by the year 2030. And that's in line with what we're seeing in uh, the rest of Asia as well. Um, in, in, in the world right now, Asia is the biggest proportion, biggest contribution to global GDP. Uh, and within, Asia, within the top 10 countries itself, you have China at number one, you have um, India at number five, and you have surprisingly Indonesia at number seven. Right? So Indonesia is, is really coming up very quickly and very uh, nicely as well. Now on top of that, this, on top of the fact that we have um, a huge middle class of people by the year 2030, we also have young, one of the youngest um, uh, um, uh, people in the world. Uh, the populations in Indonesia and Malaysia are actually very, very young. And as, as you know, young people, they are far better with uh, the internet, with all things digital than I am. <laughs> uh, and they do th pick things up very, very quickly. So you have this rising digitization of the region that's going on right now. And with rising digitization, that means that more and more of these people here are getting in touch with the internet. They're exploring the internet, they're getting educated on the internet, and they're getting exposure to all sorts of things on the internet. And if you become middle class and you get exposure to the internet and you have access to the world, that means that your consumer patterns will ultimately change. So the creative middle class that uh, Dr. Melanie Fasher was actually talking about means that, um, from my perspective, that uh, the consumption patterns will change and increasingly uh, these young people, they will demand higher quality stuff more discretionary stuff as well, instead of just the basic uh, fundamentals that, um, that they were used to in, the, in uh, 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, some of these changes have actually been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think what we've all experienced is that um, our reliance on technology has really increased um, quite dramatically. That in turn is actually putting pressure on governments in some of these countries to actually increase the capital expenditure on infrastructure, in particular, relating to like your telecoms networks, to your broadband networks, to, make, to ensure that uh, connectivity, that communication networks um, are working and we need to work from home, we can actually do it effectively with no loss in productivity. That in turn basically means that more of the transactions and, and, the, uh, and the exchange of information can actually be online rather than, on, uh, rather than physically. As you and I know, Southeast Asia is a huge region. Geographically, it is big, right? It's, it's, you know, when you fly from one part, one city in Southeast Asia to, to another city, it can be a three to four hour flight and not just a one hour or one and a half hour flight for most parts of Europe where you can actually get to. So this, this decrease or reduction in the distance, in the social distance is an absolutely critical part of it. And we're already seeing signs of it actually happening. Let's say, for example, before COVID-19, if there was a rock concert in Singapore, right? You get people from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Thailand, from the Philippines, all logging on at the same time, trying to book the tickets. So it becomes accessible to a bigger market and not just the 5.6 million people that we have in Singapore. And that's the beauty of being in, right in the heart of the Southeast Asian uh, cities itself. And last but not least, I think um, in spite of what's happened with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Southeast Asia has gone through quite a few hard knocks in the last 20 years, right? Starting with the Asian financial crisis, then we had the dot-com uh, technology bubble, the Bali 
uh, bombings, and then of course the global financial crisis in 2008. And one thing that always strikes me is that Southeast Asia has always emerged far stronger, much better than before the crisis itself. And I have no doubt that following the COVID-19 pandemic, we will all emerge in a much better uh, place as well. Thanks very much, Kelvin. I think that um, the, the adoption of technology is something that I think is really fascinating. And there's some stats that I found uh, during my researches um, that eight, sorry, four out of the eight uh, largest Facebook populations in the world are all in Southeast Asia. Indonesia comes in in third place with 140 million. Uh, the Philippines in sixth place with 81 million. Uh, Vietnam in seventh place with 65 million. And Thailand in eighth place with 50 million. And to give you an indication of, of things that uh, uh, the UK comes in at 12th, France comes in at 15th, and Italy and Germany come in at 17th and 18th respectively. So it, it really just goes to show that it's a very digitally engaged engaged environment. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's key because of the fact that uh, if you're living in a very remote area, um, having access to the internet can really do wonders for you. And we do know for a fact that consumption in Indonesia has actually gone up as well. Because with, um, with more smartphones um, in the population right now, that has actually created jobs for the young people. They can work as delivery drivers. They can work uh, with Grab, with Gojek, with some of the other digital companies as well. Then that actually pays them more than when they were actually working in the farms um, back in the countryside. And that has actually sparking a whole new virtuous cycle of consumption altogether. So it's actually working really well, uh, really well at this point in time. Thank you very much, Kelvin. I'd like, like now to, uh, to turn to Alain to um, just to really get a sense of your experience over the last, I know you've been in Asia now for 30 years, um, but it would be wonderful to hear your experiences of building further the market in Southeast Asia for Richemont's luxury goods brands and how you see the different uh, locations within Asia as playing different roles. Um, no, thanks very much for that, man. It's actually, I, I returned to Hong Kong 20 years ago, but I've been uh, well, I grew up in Hong Kong, so you know, been been basically in Asia, uh, you can say all my life with uh, stints in in the UK and in, in uh, Japan. But uh, um, always stayed very close to you know to everything that's happening in Asia. Um, and uh, actually, even when I was based in the UK, um, the company I was working for, the Asian headquarters was in Singapore. So I've been traveling to Singapore now for you know over thirty years. Um, and since I joined Richemont, of course, a lot of attention and a lot of the headlines has been on the development of China. But uh, at the same time, uh, you know, we've seen tremendous development uh, in South Asia. Uh, when I joined, we already had uh, our own uh, subsidiaries in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand uh, and Australia. So, you know, four uh, directly owned subsidiaries, which just goes to on the line, you know, that there's been a very long uh, history of luxury consumption uh, within South Asia. And uh, as has been already described, you know, by the two previous panelists, you know, the demographics are really at a very sweet spot. And I think also something to, to uh, bear in mind is, you know, the level of English proficiency um, within, you know, all these diverse countries, which really helps, uh, you know, global uh, brands and, and groups to you know, reach out and to to you know communicate and to get our messages across uh, to this you know very very uh, important and also diverse kind of different countries. Um, so for for uh, for us, uh, you know, we've seen uh, over the last, particularly over the last ten years, you know, two phen well phenomenons. One is just the acceleration of what we call the hardware or, you know, what, what uh, is available in terms of uh, retail locations. You know, if you think back to Singapore, uh, basically everything used to be you know, along Orchard Road. Um, and uh, despite the uh, Lehman crisis, you know, credit to Sands Group, you know, they, uh, you know, they put everything into the developing and, and uh, completing Marina Bay Sands. And that has become now, you know, an icon, not just within Singapore and South Asia, but I would say globally. Uh, then you have, you know, in Thailand uh, recently the launch of Icon Siam, um, and uh, you know, many many projects that now I think offer uh, a great you know choice 
to consumers, not only you know, within South Asia, but also uh, within the whole of Asia. And you see that then complemented by you know, the uh, development of tourism, which has always been very strong in South Asia. Uh, as, as I was mentioning, when I was uh, um, still based in the UK, um, you know, we used to holiday in, uh, in, in uh, Phuket every year. That was, that was our, our family uh, holiday destination where uh, uh, you know, members of the family would all congregate uh, over Christmas. And I think that you know, you've seen that acceleration of uh, tourism. Um, like you, I did a little bit of uh, research and, and found that actually um, uh, you know, arrivals from China into ASEAN uh, has gone from just 5 million in 2010 to over 30 million in uh, 2019. I mean, that's an incredible uh, development in terms of uh, tourism as well. Um, and going back to just one year ago, uh, uh, you know, when people were still traveling for Chinese New Year, uh, three of the ASEAN countries figured in the top five uh, outbound destinations for Chinese New Year, uh, with Singapore uh, actually, you know, being uh, fourth and Thailand number two, uh, Japan was top of the list. Um, so we, we have seen, you know, tremendous uh, development for, for our industry and uh, for our group uh, within all of South Asia. Um, and we continue to believe that, you know, there's still, you know, a lot of potential for us to continue that development. So it's, uh, it's a very exciting time for, uh, uh, for us to be, you know, in this part of the world. One of the things that uh, I wanted just to, to ask you about as well was um, the role of Australia in as part of the mix as well, because I know that within your framework of de describing South Asia in terms of the, uh, the, the region for, uh, for Richemont, that, that you incorporate Australia into that as well. And it'd be interesting yes. just to hear a little bit about how you see Australia fitting into the picture. Well, Australia has actually been uh, probably one of the fastest developing uh, uh, subsidiaries for us uh, within South Asia. Uh, just to, as an example, um, uh, one of our maisons, uh, Van Cleef & Arpels, uh, opened three boutiques within two years uh, in, in Australia. So from having none, had three boutiques uh, in a very short space of time, which for a maison like Van Cleef is uh, considered to be, you know, pretty aggressive. Um, and we continue to see, you know, more uh, uh, brands wanting to open stores uh, in Australia. Australia has always been a, you know, again, a, a wonderful uh, travel destination. Um, you know, a lot of direct flights. Uh, you know, the the, uh, uh, the tourism infrastructure in Australia is, has really developed a lot. Um, and also, there's a very strong, you know, local market. So, yeah, we also figures very highly uh, within, you know, the uh, uh, the whole ecosystem of South Asia for us. Thank you, Anna. Um, Patty, it would be wonderful to hear from you a little bit about your experience of, as to how the Southeast Asia market has developed and how uh, the, the increasing role that Southeast Asian collectors have been playing within the region, but also uh, globally. Um, thank you, Magnus. I've been with Sotheby's for almost 30 years now, but really the last 10 years has been very significant. Uh, for our business uh, in Asia and also in terms of Asian buyers as uh, part of our worldwide uh, uh, sales. So um, let me just, just go back to a little bit on the, the background. Sotheby's had, uh, had an office in uh, Singapore since 1985 and we started auctions in Singapore in the mid 90s um, followed by you know opening of offices in Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia and, and uh, elsewhere but the key for us had always been the focus on the top end of the art market um, we cultivate uh, buyers we, and they are then looked after by uh, the local offices but then in the last few years with the spread of the internet and particularly in the last year this this has you know completely changed um, we are seeing phenomenal growth uh, in terms of the buyer strength uh, from Asia as, as uh, Alan and, and Calvin has said before, uh, the story had much been about the greater China, uh, you know, how, how, how strong those economies have been and then uh, they're, they're buying uh, power in, in our Asian sales. But what I've seen actually is that now um, Chinese clients, Asian clients, 
buy as much within Asia as they do outside Asia. And in terms of Southeast Asian clients, they actually buy more outside Asia than they do within Asia. That's particularly because um, of the categories that we offered in, in Asia are, you know, obviously a lot of uh, Chinese works of art, classical Chinese paintings, and then other Chinese paintings that they are not as focused on. So in, uh, in really the, the, the key for them is the first focus was in the luxury, which is wine, watches, and uh, jewelry, as well as Southeast Asian pictures. Those are the really focused um, areas that of, of, their, uh, of the buying. And then later on, they moved to modern Chinese paintings, and then now in impressionist pictures, contemporary pictures, and in our sales room in New York, London, and Paris. So, you know, this is really the, the story, particularly in the last five years for Southeast Asia. And I, I'm very encouraged. Sotheby's last year had, um, you know, 408 sales online with, uh, I think we, we total um, just under 600 million um, of online only. And this is something that had, uh, as Kelvin said, uh, really accelerated by the COVID. I mean, while it is very unfortunate, this pandemic is still not under control. Um, we have seen people buying a completely changed. Um, they are, you know, comfortable sitting at home, engaging uh, digitally. Um, in terms of our population, we are seeing Asians, uh, the average age of bias in Asia uh, lower than the rest of the world. It, we have a, around 20% of our worldwide sales bias are below the age of 40. Whereas within Asia, that number is about 30%. So I am not seeing the same. Uh, Southeast Asia is actually tracking worldwide figures rather than just Asia only. And I, I think that number will change. So uh, again, more and more people joining us because of the digital platform. Um, you've mentioned before uh, Facebook and, and other engagement from Southeast Asia uh, is, has a higher number than uh, the, the rest of the world. Um, that certainly is the case, and um, because they're getting familiar with the platform, but I am seeing a slight lag um, of that in Southeast Asia with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in China. So um, I think there's some catching right. up to do. Yeah, and I understand over the last couple of years you've seen a bit of a shift in that, in that dynamic from Southeast yeah. Asia, that there's been a bit of an increase. Can you maybe just touch on that a little? Yes. Um, what I'm encouraged is that I saw that uh, trending already younger and, and, and digitally more engaged um, from China. But in the last 18 months, Southeast Asia had done a big catch up. And Singapore in particular, we saw actually 15 percent growth in the number of buyers uh, just in the last year alone. When we thought the market was actually very mature already, Singapore being a very small city um, that everything everybody can get to everywhere very easily. Actually, we grew the number of buyers out of Singapore by 15% um, just last year. So that those numbers are, are very mm. uh, encouraging. Um, the other two places um, in particular for us is Philippines and Vietnam. The, the growth for us mm. uh, in terms of the number of buyers from Vietnam and Philippines is um, double digit, obviously, but um, actually skewed the whole number of uh, Southeast Asia. So. Whereas we still have the largest number of buyers um, out of Singapore and Indonesia, the, I think the two places to watch is Vietnam and Philippines for us. That's very interesting. Um, Kelvin, I, I wanted to, um, to, to sort of follow up, obviously, uh, with Dr. Fash's uh, excellent presentation at the, at the beginning. It really sort of set the tone for the context of the rise of the sort of the, the broadening uh, middle class, if you like, but it would be interesting to hear from UBS's perspective about uh, the the wealth generation at the higher level, as it were, and uh, and how that's developing as a result of these broader economic developments. Yeah, well, I think the whole region is actually being pulled together by the uh, growth and emergence of China. Uh, since 2000, when China entered the WTO, uh, that has actually sparked a boom in this part of the world, largely because of the fact that um, China basically bought up the world's resources. And Southeast Asia actually has a lot of resources to sell to the Chinese. Like, for example, in Indonesia was coal, um, gas, um, all sorts of various uh, commodities, and likewise in Malaysia as well, and even in, uh, in Thailand, right? Um, Thailand is the biggest exporter of rice. 
Uh, Vietnam, you know, is basically home to the biggest Samsung factory outside of Korea. So the rise of China as a consumer class, as a uh, as a develop as a very important developing market in this region, has really actually pulled the rest of the region along, um, and that was the first phase of growth that we saw. Today, the second phase of growth is actually very interesting in the sense that uh, we have increasingly a number of huge unicorns based in this part of the world. And that has actually created a lot of opportunities in the areas of fintech um, and even in green tech. And we think that sustainable, in, uh, um, sustainable investments or the sustainability field is somewhere where we think it's going to become very important in this part of the world over the next 10 to 15 years. And that's actually rising quite dramatically as well. Last but not least, from our uh, from the um, wealth management perspective, we're increasingly seeing the creation of what we call family offices in this region. Um, that is still pretty much in its infancy, and family offices are quite different from uh, the um, from the um, I would say the you know the average um, ultra high net worth or high net worth um, um, consumer, because family offices tend to be a bit more sophisticated and organized in the way they invest. And I think if you have more family offices coming up, then the likelihood of these of more family offices investing in collectibles like art, wine, uh, or even yachts, etc., etc., is certainly going to become a lot more. Uh, and I do think that there has been a lot more interest in collectibles as an investment class, um, given the fact that you know they've more or less exhausted the uh, the other uh, the other asset classes already, and they are very open to in, in to to um, to exploring new things. And these collectibles are usually are uh, very, very um, uh, closely linked to the um, beneficial owner's um, interest. Could be like classic cars, wine, art, etc., etc. So that is another area that we think is growing very strongly in this part of the world. Thank you. Um, we've chosen uh, the location of Singapore as the, as the uh, place to hold uh, the major sort of hub fair for uh, Southeast Asia. Um, it would be interesting to hear from uh, from your various perspectives uh, what role do you think that Singapore plays within Southeast Asia, um, and perhaps starting with with Kelvin on that one. Yeah, I think Singapore plays can play the role of the ag aggregator of sorts in the sense that um, we have all, you know if if you look at Singapore's location, we're right, we're right smack in the heart of Southeast Asia, and therefore we're actually easily accessible by um, by all countries. Um, with this COVID nineteen, of course, with the borders closed, no one, nobody can travel. The you know the first class infrastructure that we have here, um, the uh, broadband network, the uh, accessibility uh, on all fronts, will actually come in very very useful. And therefore, if you're let's say for example, if you are a if you are a, you know an artist in Bali, um, if you're linked to Singapore, um, you can actually get access to the ex to the entire uh, World Wide Web where the consumer addressable market is concerned. So this is one area that Singapore can actually play. The other important area or sector that Singapore can play is basically in the role of finance. As you know, we are an international financial center, uh, and that's very important for this part of the world as well. And a lot of the ultra high, uh, um, 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 ultra high families um, uh, um, uh, in, in the region actually have their banking relationships originating from Singapore as well. So Singapore is is a very important hub for um, uh, in that sense. And if you want to actually attract the target market for, you know, for art, for expensive art, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Singapore is probably the place that you want to be in, uh, in that sense. And, and uh, Alain, it would be interesting to hear from your perspective in terms of the retail, luxury retail sector, what, what role sure. Singapore has been playing? Well, uh, Singapore really, you know, is uh, the showcase uh, for South Asia Oceania. Uh, you know, from our perspective, uh, you know, we've held a couple of uh, world exclusive exhibitions, uh, actually in 2016, you know, when it was uh, the celebration of the 50th uh, uh, anniversary of Singapore. Uh, Kate held actually the f first exhibition to be held uh, in the newly refurbished National Gallery. Um, where it, uh, and at that time, we brought over 600 pieces, uh, had an overwhelming response. Um, and in the same year, uh, Van Cleef and Alpels, uh, also uh, held an exhibition called The Art of Gems at Marina Bay Sands, um, together with the French National Museum of Natural History. Um, and it was a real draw, not only, of course, for you know, the indigenous Singapore population, but we had people flying in from all over the region uh, you know, to, for, for these events. Um, uh, and you know, I know of you know, other world-class events uh, that, that uh, are also being hosted in Singapore on a regular basis, 
uh, as uh, a bit of a motor racing fan. You know, I've been to the Singapore Grand Prix a number of times, um, and that has become you know, such a world-class event and such a fa fantastic showcase for Singapore. Uh, I'm told by some friends who are you know, involved in, in the marketing side that it's become now um, uh, the number one uh, preferred choice for sponsors to you know, host events uh, and to invite guests to um, beyond beyond Monaco because you know the infrastructure in Singapore is so so wonderful you know the hotels the access uh, you know flights uh, safety you know the, the the food the culture uh, so no Singapore is, is really punching above its weight in that respect. Um, so we've uh, we, we've got some wonderful questions coming through and. <clears throat> I think that it would be great to sort of uh, to try and take some of those uh, take those to the panel. Um, the the first uh, the first question is for uh, for Patty. Um, what innovations is Sotheby's taking to make what is fundamentally quite a traditional art business more relevant to the younger generation of collectors? Um, as I mentioned before. Um, we, due to the, the, the pandemic, Sotheby's had pivoted from live auctions to uh, our online platform. Um, and, and this is like, we're talking about a year on year, 600% growth in number of online sales we held. So I repeat, 408 auctions uh, were online only and uh, with a totaling about just under 600 million. And that had attracted um, a really younger uh, demographic of, of buyers. Um, so it, as Kelvin mentioned, we are seeing a lot of second and third generation buyers, uh, you know, collecting families coming on board and their tastes are differ from that of their parents. Um, while parents might be collecting uh, traditional modern art, their children are buying uh, contemporary art and also they're choosing to buy uh, primary as well as on secondary market. So I think a high quality art fair coming to Singapore is, is really uh, a key because this is where everybody should be looking to, to buy from and then to start the collecting journey. And then I'm very excited of the potential that, that this, this fair is going to bring. It, with this proximity, of course, that everybody can travel to Singapore um, naturally, uh, I think the success of, of the fair, it will be a, a really key driving point of, of the growth of uh, the contemporary art market within the region. Thank you, Patty. And I, I think I just would like to emphasize as well, and it's partially in response to one of the questions that came up about um, the art world being a, a playground for the rich and uh, for it perhaps not being so accessible for people to get engaged with. But I think that one of the things that we're very committed to as an art fair is really to try and engage with as wide as possible audience and to make it art accessible to everybody. Um, we will have works on view from a relatively modest price uh, right up to the sort of the highest level blue chip but we will have editions, prints and photographs that uh, should hopefully be, be there for, the, uh, for, for the, the sort of collector that's looking to start out at a more modest price point. Um, uh, the next question was Sorry, I'm for, not, I'm not uh, doing, for oh. I just want to say I'm not doing any plugging here, but art should you okay. know really is accessible for all, and it really is not just for elitists. And an art fair is somewhere that you yeah. can just go browse. Um, you don't have to buy, and then that's where you can learn yeah. actually and see. And and actually, you see behind me, um, I, I have some manga and and then uh, you know some toy from Daniel Ashram. It is is not about um, you know elitists. I uh, I'm afraid mm -hmm. uh, it really is is for everyone to enjoy. So I just want to put that Thank out you, there Patty. before. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. And uh, this this next uh, question was for um, for Kelvin. Um, uh, and let me just find it. Sorry, that was uh, you mentioned earlier that the rise of the family offices in Singapore. Uh, the question is, are the families and clients of the offices themselves spending more time in Singapore? Um, I would think yes. I think a lot of the uh, families um, at this point in time, they are spending more time in Singapore, largely because of the fact that they can't travel. Um, but I think increasingly they are because the family offices are being managed out of um, Singapore itself. So naturally, 
uh, if the um, younger generation are involved with the family office, and usually they are, they are actually spending a lot more time in Singapore. And um, just to add on to what Patty has said earlier, um, the taste of the second generation, third generation is actually quite different because of the fact that um, the third generation especially, uh, a lot of them are educated in Western-oriented um, universities, colleges, uh, and they are more exposed um, to the world. And therefore, their taste could be quite different from what their parents were originally uh, exposed to uh, in that sense. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why. Um, and likewise, where their investments with their, their investment portfolios are concerned, they tend to be more receptive to different sort of uh, investment ideas compared to the usual fixed income and sorry, usual FX and equities of their of their of the father's generation. And then for uh, for Alain, um, we're seeing increasing number of art and fashion collaborations. Do you think the luxury sector needs to increasingly connect and engage with the art sector and other sectors? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's always been a very symbiotic uh, relationship. You know, we have our uh, Cartier Foundation, which has, you know, a, uh, a collection that uh, tours and um, regularly. Uh, so, yes, I mean, the, 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 that relationship has always been, been there. Um, and we do collaborate, you know, on even you know, creating uh, uh, unique products. Uh, you know, Mont Blanc, for example, has... You know, uh, Collaborated on with Van Cleef even to you know bring out these collectible uh, items, which are obviously you know beyond just the functional writing instrument. They are really pieces of art. Um, and if you look at you know some of the uh, um, things that you know the, the, the craftsmanship that uh, is particularly in, in watch and jewelry, uh, it is really uh, you know miniature art in a way. So I think that is something that. Uh, we, we, we continue to uh, foster and, um, you know, we'll continue to develop. And a uh, question for, for Melanie. Um, your, uh, your focus of your research is very much on Southeast Asia. Could you contextualize that with uh, the rest of the world? Um, yeah, this is a very good question. Um, as mentioned, we use the concept creative class, which uh, was coined by Richard Florida, and his research uh, has been focusing on the United States. There is a lot of publications out there. Um, and uh, from there, the academic debate uh, engaged with Europe and then other parts of the world, but not really Southeast Asia. So this project was an attempt to look at another very dynamic region. Uh, region. Um, as I said, um, urbanization is the major driving factor of economic development. Um, yeah, I think if we go back to the graphs that I showed about the creative class, I think it's important to keep in mind that in advanced nations, one third to 40% in Singapore right now, over 50% already account for the creative class. Um, and we will see similar development over time in other parts of the world, including Southeast Asia. Well, thank you, Melanie. Uh, well, our, our time has rushed past, uh, I'm afraid, um, but it's been a real pleasure to, to have you all speaking today. Thank you very much for your, uh, your excellent and uh, exceptional insights. So I'd, I'd very much like to thank uh, Kelvin, to Alain, uh, Patty, and Melanie uh, for their participation. Uh, we're very excited about the prospects for, for Singapore, for Southeast Asia, uh, and we look forward to playing our part in helping to uh, put the spotlight on the great things that are happening in the region. Um, we very much look forward to welcoming you to our next RTSG Times UBS panel discussion, which will take place later in the spring. Um, and I should add that the reason for the collaboration with UBS is because UBS are our highly esteemed and long-term founding and lead partner for ArtSG, and we're very grateful for their ongoing support. Um, I would encourage uh, visitors to visit our website, www.artsg.com, for further details about the fair, and to follow us on social media, on Instagram at art.sg, and on Facebook forward slash ArtSG Fair. 
Uh, we very much look forward to further discussions over the coming months and look forward to welcoming you to Singapore in due course. Thank you very much.